Hello and a very warm welcome to this session we have titled Risky Business Supporting Fragile and Conflict Affected Situations on COVID-19, Climate and the SDGs. Fragile and conflict affected situations deserve special attention. Fragility is costly not just for the country and its citizens, but also for neighboring countries and for the global community. Failure to engage in these situations differently and in an innovative manner is likely to entail further human, social, economic and security costs. This year, Independent Evaluation Department released a report assessing ADB's engagement in fragile and conflict affected situations and in small island countries. Let's see what the report has to say. How will we worry law? Who will be on the law? Law is a law altogether. We also have a bit of a lemon to one and buy. Sometimes by me, that by me, if you will get a no more on the staff, only look at them like law. While COVID-19 has impacted lives and livelihoods globally, small island developing states and those already struggling with fragility and conflict have been hit harder. In early 2022, IED released a report assessing ADB's engagement in fragile and conflict situations and in small island countries. The assessment sought to answer the overarching question, how can ADB boost quality and effectiveness of its engagement in FCAS and CIS to deliver on the expectation that it can improve livelihoods, inclusiveness, and resilience in these countries? To boost the quality and effectiveness of its engagement in FCAS and CIS, ADB needs to do the following. First, ADB and other multilateral development banks tend to place greater emphasis on active conflict in FCAS than on long-term institutional fragilities in CIS when implementing their FCAS-related approaches. While the FCAS definition covers both fragility and conflict, the fragilities faced by CIS tend to be overshadowed by the active conflict experienced in FCAS. Second, Capacity challenges as the key constraints on the development of FCAS and CIS. Such challenges hamper states' ability to carry out basic governance functions, making it more difficult for development organizations like ADB to operate in this context. Given this, improved quality at entry of ADB's capacity development initiatives is needed as well as more long-term engagement rather than the more standard provision of technical assistance over a few months period. Third, ADB is tapping UN agencies to implement its projects in conflict-affected areas to enable continued delivery of crucial humanitarian and development assistance in conflict zones, fiduciary security, project monitoring procurement, and anti-corruption systems of MDBs and UN agencies may need to be harmonized. Finally, ADB country partnership strategies and project results frameworks do not always include conflict or fragility sensitive indicators or narratives. This makes it difficult to assess to what extent FCAS and CIS are transitioning out of the fragility and or conflict spectrum. 62 donors operating in very small countries. The bandwidth for these countries to deal with a whole number of development partners while at the same time dealing with all of their domestic challenges is really a big issue. And so coordination among donors is really critical to not put too much of a burden on these governments that are already dealing with a lot of challenges. Sometimes donors come with their specific, they have specific you know, mandates to address this, and some come with the same ones too, so there's a lot of duplication. They should come and actually see for themselves, or even before that, they should undertake some consultations. But right now, I think it's only with the national government. And most of these from the national government don't even go out to the provinces and actually consult them on what they need. 
What we really need ADB is to do further capacity building on the job training of our project coordinators or institutions or units within the government so that they can adhere to the best practices, both internationally, but also be agile to the country needs. Meanwhile, time and hope are running low for the people on the front lines. Development organizations need to rethink, intensify, and further tailor their support and partnerships to address fragility and conflict and build resilience in Africa's and seized environments. Lots of messages there, and I'm certain that many of them will come up in the panel discussion that is to follow. That was Hyun Song, Principal Evaluation Specialist that you saw in the video, and she was also the team leader for the evaluation that I'm referring to. She will be available to answer any questions that you might have on the report in the designated question and answer session, which comes later on in the event. Now, uh, today we will be using Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A session a little bit about how this works so that uh, you have no inconvenience in using it. Pigeonhole Live is a simple interactive mobile website where you can submit questions to the panel of speakers. All you need to do is click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page and it will direct you to the session Q&A. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you may scan the QR code you see on the screen or just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode, which is ADBMNL55. Once again, that's ADBMNL55. If you have any questions, and we encourage you to have lots of questions throughout the panel discussion, feel free to submit them through the pigeonhole. And now let's get on straight to the panel discussion today. In today's discussion, we will try to draw on the experiences of ADB and other agencies to suggest approaches which will enhance the effectiveness of MDB financing and advisory services in these countries. We're very lucky today to have uh, Ruataro, uh, Moatani, Senior Director, Head of the Office of Peacebuilding, Governance and Peacebuilding Department at JICA. Samuel Tumiva, Advisor, Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department and Chief of Fragile and Conflict Affected Situations, that's FCAS. And Sherry Kalinberg, Associate Director, Evidence and Research International Rescue Committee. And today's session will be moderated by DG IED, Manny Jimenez. So Manny, it's over to you now. Thank you very much, uh, Saleha and Hyun, for a great, great summary of a very good report. And uh, thank you, uh, Yotaro, uh, Sam, and Sheree for joining me in, in uh, what I hope will be a stimulating conversation on a very serious and important uh, topic. What I'll do is I'll uh, make sure that uh, we have a, a, a dialogue for the next 20 minutes or so. And then I'll start monitoring the uh, Q&A and invite Hyun to join us as a panelist in uh, answering the audience questions. But before we get to that, uh, let me begin uh, with you, Ryotaro san um, Before you put on your, your JICA hat for a minute, I want to take advantage of your long experience living in uh, fragile and conflict-affected areas. Uh, I know you've been in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and also what, you hear, what you've heard from in, while you're in JICA from the client's perspective, what have you heard are the main challenges that these uh, countries are facing in uh, trying to deal with their situation and absorbing the assistance that well-meaning agencies and people would like to give them? Over to you. Thank you, Mani. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the ADB for the publication of this important report and uh, appreciate the ADB as well uh, for organizing this uh, important conversation. And uh, on, 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 this, on the challenges of the fragile uh, situations, 
I think the, the biggest uh, challenge uh, the, uh, our partners are facing is the capacity constraints. And the capacity constraints, uh, while they are also facing the challenges to deliver uh, quick wins. So in the case of uh, Mindanao or in many other uh, uh, conflict affected uh, contexts, we are trying to uh, help uh, the uh, partners both uh, in terms of delivering the quick wins uh, for uh, demonstrating uh, the peace dividends uh, to the local communities, as well as long-term capacity development and institution building so that the, uh, the society or the country uh, will be resilient to the future uh, conflict shocks. And uh, as we have the capacity constraints, the most important thing is the capacity development uh, for the long term. So I think in terms, in terms of our engagement from the uh, outside, it's important that we have continuous uh, engagement so that uh, we can uh, go along with the efforts of the fragile uh, conflict affected states uh, to build their uh, institutions and the capacities and the uh, community resilience. And lastly, I, sh I should mention that the, the, as, as the report uh, rightly mentioned, the importance of the coordination. Uh, we have lots of uh, partners from outside willing to support uh, from the humanitarian perspective, uh, peace perspective or development perspectives. And I think it's important that we uh, coordinate uh, with each other so that we can complement uh, with each other with different strengths so that we can uh, support the, uh, the country's efforts to build a resilient society. Thanks very much, Jotaro. Um, very uh, important challenges indeed, capacity building while delivering quick wins and continuous engagement and coordination are really important issues. And I want to get back to you a little later on to, to ask how JICA is responding to this. But let me first uh, turn to Sam. Uh, Sam, uh, you're overseeing um, ADB's uh, uh, initiatives in uh, FCAS and SIDS approaches. And you heard what Yotaro mentioned about these really vexing and wicked challenges that we have to confront. Uh, so, uh, uh, how is ADB doing from your side? Uh, we heard the report, but does that resonate with you and your colleagues? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Manny. I think it does. I think the report that the Independent Evaluation Department has shared with us really did um, uh, kick us as an institution to pay more attention. Our strategy 2030 calls for a differentiated approach backed by the empirical or the evidential work that's been done by the independent evaluation department on how our projects in uh, FCAS and SIDS have not performed as well as in other regions, I think has really awakened us to the importance uh, of this and why we need to act very specifically, really get into institutionalizing specific changes in ADB to improve our performance in FCAS and SIDS. And um, I think in many ways, the, this FCAS team that I uh, oversee and manage, um, which supports our operations departments, uh, we've only been around for a year and a half, but I think um, through this uh, one ADB approach in, uh, where we're all pulling together um, towards the same goal uh, has already begun to show some positive results and I'll be happy to talk uh, further later about, about it. But yes, I think um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You know, I was sitting in the uh, meeting of the uh, the annual meeting. Uh, the annual meeting is going on right now, as we all know. And uh, there was a meeting with the Pacific uh, governors with uh, ADB management. And their concerns, uh, the top things in their concerns have to do with climate change, of course, um, uh, response or recovery from COVID, which continues to be uh, an issue um, and also with regard to food security and inflation which will be affecting them so you know as we look at uh, addressing the needs of uh, our countries that are fragile their countries that are in conflict but more specifically all these countries that are the small island developing states 
Uh, I think it's important that um, you had asked earlier, what are the challenges? These are the specific challenges that uh, our SIDS countries are facing. Back to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Uh, and thank you for uh, reminding us about the special uh, uh, needs of our, especially sm uh, countries in small, and, uh, I that are small island developing countries and are also fragile and conflict affected. Uh, a double whammy, if, uh, if, if you like. Uh, Cherie, uh, the International Rescue Committee, IRC, is one of the most respected agencies in the world when it comes to providing quick assistance and being there on, uh, on the ground. But I wanna to turn to your expertise on um, results and evidence, and uh, especially coming from IED, where that is our bread and butter. I wanted to get your perspective. What are the special challenges to you as someone who has to report on um, the evidence uh, in uh, uh, in these countries, uh, and also, what have you found from IRC? Yeah, thank you so much, Manny. Um, first, for uh, conducting this type of review of ADB operations and for making it public, and then for convening a discussion like this around it and inviting IRC to be a part of it. So. The biggest challenge that we faced as, as IRC um, focusing on not just assessing uh, the impact of our own programs, but on cultivating a practice of being evidence-based and evidence-informed in our decision-making is just the dearth of evidence, um, rigorous, high-quality, reliable evidence that exists in the context in which we operate. Um, there are significant gaps around many of the outcomes and the lived realities, the uh, changes that we want to see in people's lives. Um, first, we realize that in a lot of our work, uh, and I, just, I don't mean IRC's work uh, alone, but more generally speaking, in the humanitarian sector, we realize that we struggle with very clearly defining outcomes, right? Which is a necessary condition for being able to rigorously measure anything, right? Um, and then the other uh, sort of gap is really around intentional, deliberate, rigorous impact evaluations. Now, of course, there has been significant growth in the number of evaluations conducted in fragile and conflict-affected contexts since about 2010. Um, but we realize that these are clustered largely around areas um, such as education, uh, I would say social protection, and some livelihood types of operations. And I am sure you don't find this uh, surprising. But for many places uh, that we work in, our clients really are struggling with issues of power, of um, equity, of safety, uh, dignity, right? Um, the, the struggles around uh, how to exercise one, one's right to self-governance, if you will. So how do we measure these things accurately? How do we understand how the most disenfranchised populations display internally display and how can we understand better just how what the impact of our programs through here. No, thanks, uh, Cherie. Uh, uh, just quick follow-up, uh, really important challenge on uh, looking at uh, indicators of success that are a little less uh, tangible. Uh, do you have any examples where IRC has been able to, uh, perhaps at a case study or anything that would uh, you'd find uh, passes muster on uh, some of these mm. uh, softer issues, if you like, of power and equity? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, that is just still a knot we're trying to unravel. I think we have relied um, largely and have made significant investments in formalizing our um, client responsiveness model, like really getting better at collecting data around our client insights and experiences. And this 
stretches across the board. So I know the question is geared more towards these fuzzy, uh, so more nebulous outcomes. But I think it's our starting point really is getting better at understanding um, client insights across the board, whether it's through a livelihoods project or a governance or power project. Um, I think right now, what our teams are also doing are um, is taking a, an approach, a human-centered design approach to really figuring out how we articulate these constructs in real life. Yeah. Um, one project that comes to mind is a protection preparedness project, right? Like trying to understand just how, how do we measure dignity and a sense of safety? Um, we don't have the indicator just yet, but what's inspiring is, is the approach that we're taking to get there. Again, uh, bringing to bear skills like behavioral insights, human-centered design um, into this work. Great. No, thanks uh, very much. Uh, Sam, um, uh, Cherie talked about the dearth of evidence uh, from their point of view. And uh, I'd like to go back to, uh, uh, from your perspective, I know that ADB holds itself to account on uh, how it uh, tracks uh, its successes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, how we're trying to, here in this institution, uh, monitor um, where it is that, uh, how, how it is that we're doing in this very challenging area. Uh, thanks, Manny. And Sheree, I really like the points you made earlier about this uh, human-centered approaches in design. And I really spent a lot of time uh, learning about that, but it's something I'll be looking into. It's very interesting uh, and very relevant to our work. But back to your question, Manny, I, um, you know, we have not done very well as an institution um, monitoring and reporting how we've been doing in FCAS uh, in the past uh, in the past 10, 15 years. And it's something that as a result, we are not able to learn from the mistakes we've done and therefore plan uh, how we might improve on them. Uh, so for our team, uh, knowledge and analytics has been uh, a high priority. We now have established a database that has all the FCAS projects that are currently active. We have a database that goes back 10 years that tracked even the completed FCAS, uh, projects in FCAS going back 10 years. And we've done, some, we've done some analytics and tried to find out, you know, what are the reasons for projects not doing so well in FCAS um, and SIDS also. And, you know, we've, we've, had a few lessons, so, um, and I think we're working now to share the lessons with our operations colleagues so that um, we don't make the same mistakes going forward. For example, we know that there are four main reasons why projects in FCAS and SIDS have not done as well. Uh, the main reasons have to do with delays in procurement, has to do with uh, capacity to do financial management and financial reporting. Um, safeguards is a big issue, um, you know, because in the Pacific, you know, a lot of the land is a community or tribal land, and therefore we need to adjust our process and procedures for safeguards to uh, take these things into consideration. And finally, um, changing government priorities uh, is another reason. So and, and these are the main four. And now we're able to look at, you know, what have been the major delays in the transport sector or what have been the major delays in the energy sector. Um, and so we can break down with this database, we can break down all the main causes and you know, for the next person that's designing a transport project in Papua New Guinea, we can say, hey, listen, this is what's happened in the last 10 years for transport projects in Papua New Guinea. These are the uh, reasons for, for delays. There may have been capacity constraints with counterparts, and perhaps we need to enhance that capacity or build that capacity um, with safeguards on, 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 on uh, resettlement and roads. These are the issues that have come out in the past. So let's address these at the design stage so that, you know, we're not going to come up with a bad project in the end. So, you know, knowledge and analytics is something we really need to do. And then moving on from there is then the, the, the reporting, the, the annual reporting that we go should amongst ourselves, but also to management so it can be tracked and to our board. And we can, we can see now, you know, we can see how we're doing. Um, so yeah, Manny, this is a very important part of what we need to do. Uh, part of the evaluation highlighted this, and uh, and so this is something that's very high priority uh, for those of us working in the FCAS and SIDS. No, thanks. Uh, 
Let me follow up a question to both you and actually Ryotaro uh, on a question that came up actually uh, from the from the floor. Uh, I think it's a good time to bring it in because uh, Sam, you talked about um, delays, implementation, uh, challenges of uh, capacity development, uh, monitoring. Uh, these are challenges that bedevil every project that we do, even in non-FCAS countries. Um, what is it that we need to do, and I'll ask the same question to you, Tara, what is JICA doing that differentiates its approach to FCAS SIDS countries versus non-FCAS countries? Development is a very challenging endeavor. So first, Sam, then Yotaro. Thank you, Manny. You know what? A lot of the things that we're proposing to do in the FCAS and SIDS approach, uh, and we're trying to institutionalize, is really it's really good development, right? I'm a my degree is in development studies, and the theoretical work that you studied, that I studied when I was in graduate school, had and, uh, is a lot to do with good development. I think the reality is that um, we're always pressed for. For, for time and resources. And therefore, we, we, we as an institution or, or maybe development professionals across the board, um, often don't pay as much attention as they need to on specific things. So I think on the back end, when you talk about uh, eval evaluation, the far back end, but you know, monitoring and evaluation really needs to be addressed upfront that during the design of the project, even at the conceptual state of the project, we should already be thinking about um, taking in knowledge and analytics of previous projects, uh, designing in the, the, the knowledge and uh, the, the, the reporting, the monitoring, and then therefore the continuous learning. Um, one of the things perhaps that we need to do, not perhaps, for sure, we need to do a lot better, is not only understanding the context, but be very specific on what the risks are that each project faces, whether they be country risk or site-specific risk or contract risk. And that's just something that we don't do very well in ADB. You know, we have a thing in our um, uh, project design documents. It's just a little table, maybe three lines that talk about risk. You know, I was a project officer in ADB. I designed projects and I just put in my two, three or four little things. But that needs to be much more rigorous to really identify what these risks are and how we plan to mitigate them. Uh, and then going on beyond that is then to design, uh, uh, we have what's called a project administration memorandum, uh, which, which highlights to our government counterparts how we're going to implement this project. And we've talked about differentiated approaches, if we talk about um, uh, a tailored approaches to working in FCAS, and CIS, this is where we can capture how we're differentiating our approach. The, uh, the Office of the Auditor General did an audit last year on how we've done on our project administration memorandum. They're all basically template and cookie cutter. So we really need as an institution to spend some time and effort into being very specific on design features, on flexibilities in our policies and procedures and highlight them in our project administration memorandum, uh, making sure that our counterparts uh, understand them, can implement them, uh, and, then, and then go on and implement them. We also need to, this is the third thing, we also need to have a culture of uh, risk-informed uh, agility, and then something that was talked about in the, in the video there. You know, I think we'd sometimes design our projects, and then we keep going forward when, you know, in, in, uh, in circumstances often change. And we need to have this risk-informed decision-making and flexibility to redesign and retarget and repurpose projects as, as the need comes. So those are some steps, I think, many that uh, we're working towards. Um, we're also working to um, change the staff instructions on sovereign operations. And so we institutionalize all these changes, not just small changes, but it's in the guidelines for ADB project officers. This is how you do things. So I think that's important. Thank you, man. No, thanks, Sam. Uh, and, and your point about uh, uh, having a, a risk-based approach that's tailored to country needs is one that certainly came out in the, uh, in the report, and we might get back to that. Uh, but uh, Ryotaro, I just wondered from your JICA perspective, how, how does uh, JICA approach this uh, uh, vexing uh, problem of differentiating its uh, 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 the way it engages with um, FCAS and CIS countries from those who are not? Or, or, or maybe you don't, I don't know, but uh, please tell us. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, first of all, I fully agree with what uh, Sam said, as well as what uh, Cherie said, uh, in terms of the challenges, in terms of how we, we should improve our, ourselves, uh, including how we evaluate our performance. And three points I would like to make. First is the uh, context, context specificity. Uh, in the fragile context. We all understand that we need to have a um, risk evaluation, risk assessment, and a risk-informed uh, decision-making in all contexts. But I think uh, but in, but in the con fragile conflict-affected situations, the situations uh, vary uh, across countries as well as, as, uh, as, well as it, it changes. So I think uh, we need to be flexible and to adjust to the uh, contexts in the uh, fragile and conflict-affected environment. And in terms of the performance evaluation as well, uh, we are applying the OECD DAC uh, evaluation criteria, six criteria. But uh, in, in uh, conflict-affected uh, conflict situations, uh, some, uh, some of the criteria uh, may not be uh, as important as in other uh, environments. So it's an, kind of an, uh, an, an, an challenge to adjust uh, some different context. And the second point, uh, what I liked uh, in your report is the emphasis on the uh, drivers of fragility. And what I heard from Cherie about the human-centered approach, that re resonates a lot with the JICA's approach, uh, uh, JICA's human security approach. In human security, we are saying that we have human-centered, uh, prevention-oriented, but multi-sectoral approach, and that we, we need to build um, societies and the institutions that secure uh, the dignity of uh, each individual uh, in, in these societies. And that uh, requires us of not an individual project or uh, each sector uh, sectoral engagement, but we need to look at the uh, society as a whole, uh, whether we are improving, uh, whether we are addressing uh, the drivers of fragility so that we are building a more resilient society. So I think uh, we also conduct the project-based evaluation on the each uh, project, but it doesn't necessarily capture what we are uh, uh, contributing in terms of um, resilience uh, enhancement in each society. So I think a theory of change approach or uh, looking at the drivers of fragility is very, very important so that we can have a broader uh, picture. And the third point is the more, uh, I mean, even more, even broader uh, picture than the uh, JICA's engagement in each uh, country. And this is a kind of a more coordinated uh, evaluation or assessment. As I mentioned, the coordination amongst international partners is very, very important in the conflict-affected situations. So that we would, we are hoping that we would not be looking at our own engagement in fragile context, but in a broader picture, uh, how we are, how uh, international communities or international national communities are addressing the drivers of fragilities as a whole and how we are, how JICA is complementing with other engagement so that collectively uh, we are uh, contributing to, uh, um, to a peace and stability in the, uh, in the conflict affected areas. No, thanks, uh, Yotaro. Uh, I think I want to get back to this question of coordination uh, uh, across, uh, and I was struck in the, in the first video uh, about uh, the numbers of donors in a very constrained space, yes. basically getting in each other's way, how not to do that. I'd like to get your perspectives, each of you, on, on that point. But first, just quick follow-up. Uh, uh, you know, um, coming from ADB and I was at the World Bank for many years, uh, flexibility in operational work and capturing human dignity were not our strong points. Uh, and I was just wondering whether uh, you have developed any tools uh, that might be helpful in JICA uh, to uh, uh, try to get at these uh, very difficult but crucial uh, aspects of our work? 
No, unfortunately, I don't have a, a particular tool uh, to share, but we are hoping that we can, uh, we can develop one. And what we are uh, emphasizing or what we value the most is a trust building uh, in, the, uh, in the local uh, communities. Trust building amongst the local communities, as well as the trust building between the local communities and the state institutions. So if we can build a better uh, trust or a better confidence of the local communities to the state institutions, it will be um, a resilient uh, state and societies. And how we evaluate on how we measure uh, the trust uh, between the state and the societies, as well as the trust within the local communities, is a challenge we are facing. And if you have a good tool, uh, I would appreciate that very much. But we are hoping that we can create uh, something uh, to monitor, uh, either by the theory of change or either by uh, some innovative tools. Uh, but, but I think that's, that's something, that, that's the way to go. Thanks. Uh, before I turn over to the audience and bring Hyun in, Sheree, I'm sure uh, this is a topic that uh, you might have something to say. And you have, uh, you know, a bilateral, a major bilateral here uh, in this panel, as well as a major multilateral. Uh, what advice would you have to give to us as we try to operationalize uh, some of these difficult questions based on the experience you've had at IRC, uh, which has probably been longer in, in, in capturing these elusive uh, aspects? Yeah. Thanks, Lenny. Um, quite a few points to share here. So um, MD MDBs are, first of all, we want to acknowledge that they're generating important and relevant evidence and learning that inform improvements and broad approaches to development and that can integrate a humanitarian perspective. Uh, we're seeing this, um, so we want to applaud where this is happening already. For example, the World Bank's gender dimensions of forced displacement displacement research. Um, we can see where that is informing the work of the bank on gender as well as poverty reduction. And this can be extremely useful for informing the bank's engagement with high refugee hosting countries, for instance. Right? We're also thinking through the opportunities that M MDBs like yourself have to generate more data and evidence, particularly by measuring the needs and by evaluating outcomes and collecting data that tracks the differential impacts across gender, race, age, disability, sexual orientation, and displacement status, right? Quantitative and qualitative data on the gendered impacts of forced displacement are often very much lacking in our context. Um, and then that leads to shortcomings in program design, and even measuring progress. So organizations like yourself um, have the opportunity to ensure displaced people are included in the sort of large multiple surveys that, that you administer, um, you know, the national population or household type surveys and have the opportunity to disaggregate this data and collect longitudinal data and track trends over time and understand as your report says, like the drivers of these experiences. Um, we have been engaged with and realized that the, the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center is trying to attract um, towards this type of goal. Um, as your report says, to benefit you know, people in fragile and conflict-affected settings, financing needs to be flexible and there needs to be consideration of partners beyond national governments. Um, particularly in the context in which we work. Um, so another reflection that my team and the policy and advocacy team were discussing um, in advance of this meeting was the need for all the partners in this humanitarian peace development nexus, if you will, um, to better understand each other's programs, your target com communities and like, exactly how we target beneficiaries, right? These are all areas where we can see development banks um, deepening collaboration with humanitarian actors. Both sides can learn from understanding each other's goals 
and or targeting criteria and as part of those exchanges to better reach the most vulnerable populations at scale, which is again another factor that you bring. Mm. And we also think that you know these types of conversations uh, and collaborations uh, can help us to get around to thinking about the long-term solution to get individuals off the humanitarian roles and to towards more sustainable livelihoods and, and futures. And that's the goal that we all share. Um, and I think from, again, from the research to an evidence to action side, which is really where I sit in the organization, it would be tremendously helpful if um, organizations like yourself, institutions like yourself, would, where you fund social programs, um, would conduct and release really good quality cost analyses so that we have a sense of the comparative cost of these kinds of public services, right? And at IRC, we are really pushing ourselves to be mindful and deliberate in calculating and analyzing costs at every stage of our design and implementation, and to also work with partners and policymakers to make informed decisions about how to allocate their funding for maximum impact. And so having that information from um, your very large operations would be tremendously helpful as well. Great. No, thanks very much, uh, Sheree. And uh, I will actually, uh, just a heads up, Yotaro and Sam, come back to you on the challenges Sheree posed for uh, organizations like, uh, like ourselves, especially on this handover from humanitarian assistance to long-term development. And is that going as smoothly as we, we all would like? And she has some ideas about that. And then this idea of sharing data especially on cost. But before I get to that, I'd like to now um, bring in uh, Hyun, uh, who is the uh, uh, lead on the report that, that, uh, that, that we did. Uh, and uh, Hyun, um, there were a couple of questions uh, that came up uh, in our discussion, but also in the chat on a couple of things that uh, uh, I'd like your perspective on. Uh, one is on what have you found about uh, ADB's gender responsiveness? in FGAS and SIDS countries. And the second is, uh, uh, you know, you, you raised the issue of, uh, and uh, also others have raised the issue of the important capacity constraints uh, in these environments. And what is uh, our advice on how to address them? So gender and capacity building, Hyun, over to you. Thanks. Maybe I can uh, start with the capacity issue, especially in this context. I mean, uh, just like a poverty trap, uh, fragility can be also deemed as a trap. And capacity and governance challenges are a major contributor to this FCAS trap. So they prevent the states from moving out of the fragility and or conflict spectrum uh, because limited state functions make it difficult for governments and even development, uh, development organizations like ADB to achieve lasting uh, development results in Africa and this context. And this is particularly the case in the Pacific we found where the gaps in government capacity and human resources are so big and severe. And some development partners recognize that direct capacity supplementation may be a way forward in the Pacific where uh, capacity constraints are severe and human resources are very limited. Uh, development partners need to maintain very strong on the ground uh, presence in FKS and CIS context, which would entail allocating uh, adequate uh, resources. We found that in some cases, capacity supplementation may involve even consultants from other Pacific countries to provide a pathway for uh, regional uh, knowledge sharing 
uh, in addition, as a long-term solution, uh, multilateral development banks should continue to invest in human capital, uh, which may include even gender dimension and skills development to expand uh, human resource pool in Africa's and uh, CIS context. And when it comes to gender, uh, on gender, uh, it is definitely a challenge, not only for Africa and CIS, but also for other developing member countries in the region, I would say. So in a way, uh, the issue of addressing gender issues is linked very much to capacity issues uh, in Africa and CIS. Uh, legal and uh, regulatory institutions meant to address gender issues need to be particularly uh, uh, enhanced. So broader capacity interventions also uh, should also, uh, uh, I mean, broader capacity interventions should focus also on the uh, gender related uh, institutions. Okay, I will stop here. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Hyun. Uh, I, I now want to get back to you, uh, Yutaro and, and Sam, on the, on the quest, question that, that Sheree raised on, um, uh, especially on this handover issue of, uh, you know, um, our, our institutions, our uh, main objective is long-term development. And uh, we've been pushed, sometimes kicking and screaming, uh, into uh, intervening in the humanitarian space, uh, or at least to show that we're doing something uh, very quickly, uh, especially in FGAS and, and, and SIDS countries. Can you each talk about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, for us uh, in, that, uh, in that transition? And if you could also relate it to a question that's come up several times in the chat on uh, the difference between um, loans and grants, uh, and how in a uh, in a uh, you know humanitarian setting we are giving grants more, and, and uh, to what extent has uh, is our processing perhaps a little bit different in that than it is for loans? So first, Yataro, over to you, and then to Sam on these questions. Thank you. Um, in terms of our collaboration or partnership with the humanitarian agencies, I don't see it as a transition or a handover uh, these days, because we are working together uh, simultaneously. Uh, but uh, for instance, in Uganda, which is uh, in Africa, uh, there is a uh, long-term uh, protracted uh, refugee hosting uh, situation where refugee communities have been receiving the humanitarian assistance and the host communities has been supported by the development agencies. And these two uh, demands are somewhat overlapping or similar to each other so that we can work together uh, to deliver uh, the better services, better uh, uh, social services, uh, working with the humanitarian agencies. So I think there are lots of cases where we can work together uh, in parallel, uh, complementing with each other, that the humanitarian assistance are providing a quick uh, relief where we can provide long-term uh, development support, uh, be it capacity development, uh, livelihood support, or infrastructure development. So I think that kind of combination of a collaboration uh, that's what we call human HTP uh, nexus rather than uh, transition or uh, handover. So I am hoping that we can share uh, the uh, same perspective. And in terms of the coordination, uh, even amongst the development partners, I think the most important thing is we share the assessment or analysis and the strategies towards overcoming the fragilities. Uh, together so that we can work uh, jointly. And with the humanitarian agencies, uh, because we have coming, we are coming from different uh, principles, uh, we may need some more uh, time and investment or efforts <clears throat> to uh, learn each other. 
but that's uh, something worth uh, uh, investing our time. And in terms of our using of the grants and loan, loans, uh, we are uh, applying the, uh, these two instruments uh, based on the uh, demands from at, at, at in, the, in the local context. And mostly we are applying the grants uh, in the fragile and conflict affected uh, situations. But in some cases, uh, such as in providing infrastructure in the refugee hosting communities, or providing a infrastructure um, that connects the sub-national uh, conflict affected regions with other parts of the country. So there are uh, some contexts that we can apply uh, loans as well. Uh, just quick follow up, uh, Ryotaro. Are you, are you using the same processes for the grants as you are for loans or are they different? Uh, do you have a different set in JICA? Uh, we have a different uh, different processes, and I think we are talking uh, um, talking uh, with the partner government, so our partners uh, would understand how we can how we use different uh, um, tools. But I think it's 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 important that we share uh, the perspective. So uh, we, even though we apply uh, different procedures. Uh, JICA and the partner governments would understand how we can uh, use different tools. Great, no thanks. Uh, Sam, over to you. Uh, is it as seamless in ADB as it seems to be for JICA in uh, uh, handling both short-term and long-term uh, development challenges? Manny, I, you know, just now you said uh, sometimes it's uh, we're kicking and screaming coming into this, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out the humanitarian development peace nexus, or peace humanitarian development peace nexus. Um, just a quick story. Um, ADB's president was uh, preparing uh, to meet with the head of UNHCR or ICRC, I can't remember which, and I was preparing a briefing for them. And one of the people that was uh, providing inputs to the briefing said, uh, please remind the president that uh, ADB is a development agency and the other one is a humanitarian agency and that we will stay with development. Uh, so I put that in the briefing notes, and then one of the president's advisors said uh, that was the old ADB. The new ADB is not going to draw that line between humanitarian development uh, as a thick black line as it used to be. And in fact, that sort of led our work in um, the review and uh, revision of our disaster and emergency assistance policy, where instead of a, a very strict line between uh, humanitarian work and development work, there's actually a a gray area there uh, where there's overlap and there's, there's, there's an excess so that, you know, when we talked about, oh, there's a, a storm that just hit the Philippines and, and okay, it's humanitarian assistance, but if we need to get the electricity back on as soon as possible, um, that's already rebuilding, you know, and, and, and so we need to move into that space. We need to help build that bridge so that emergency supplies can get to that island that's already part of that humanitarian development nexus. So so getting our, our minds around this, um, hasn't been easy in ADB. I think there's still some resistance uh, with with colleagues thinking, you know, uh, humanitarian is one thing and development is another thing. But as as if we can get involved earlier into it, um, the better. I think also um, the co discussions we've been having with traditional humanitarian organizations, whether it be ICRC or, or, or the others, or IRC, sorry, um, uh, they're also looking at the uh, us helping them on humanitarian financing. And that's something that they, they believe we have some capacity on and we can cooperate and collaborate with. So that's been a very good thing. The other point um, that Sheree talked about was sort of the issue of uh, forced displacement. And this is, again, part of that humanitarian peace, uh, development peace nexus. It's really in a, not our, isn't part of our psyche, right? Uh, Ritoro early talked about the drivers of fragility, the main, four main drivers of fragility, economic uh, drivers, structural drivers, institutional drivers. And, and, and so if we look at um, uh, uh, the issue of displacement, whether it's forced, or forced displacement or economic displacement and the social issues around that, it's something that's not a large part of our psyche. We see that as a humanitarian issue. But in fact, if, if, if unaddressed, you know, whether it's, it's people leaving your country or people coming into your country or people who are displaced because of natural hazards in your country, it becomes a significant driver of fragility. And it's something that we need to address. So 
Um, there's an MDB working group on economic migration and forced displacement, <clears throat> of which we're a part. And then we, in turn, established a working group here in ADB on economic migration and forced displacement to try to bring in some of the knowledge, bring in some of the processes and, 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 and the best practice that are taking place uh, globally so that we understand it better. We've also learned that uh, there are quite a few colleagues in ADB that are doing work with regard to economic migration, forced displacement, but it's disparate and they're all doing their own little things. And by having this working group, um, we can uh, mutually support each other. We've done a mapping exercise to try to understand all the work that we're doing. The, our goal now is to b begin to bring it into the psyche of the organization that, you know, if you're working on something, we need to take the issue of displacement quite seriously because unless uh, addressed, it continues to serve as a driver of fragility. So it's not been an easy uh, task, but it's something that we're, we're, um, we've identified as something uh, that needs attention. We are putting attention to it and, and uh, further discussions and collaboration with organizations that are working on this is, is something we continue to do. Great, no thanks. Uh, no, really rich discussion. We're running out of time. I'm gonna give each of you, starting with Hyun, just so, as a, a, a warning, uh, 15 seconds uh, to uh, come up with uh, your uh, last perspectives that we wanna leave with the audience on um, what uh, top priority from your point of view as uh, we in this uh, well-meaning development specialist try to help in FCAS and SIDS uh, settings. So Hyun, first to you. Hyun, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. To your question is partnership. But before doing that, with multiple crises currently unfolding around the globe, I would say that the topic we had just had on fragility and conflict will never be irrelevant as every country faces its own set of fragility and conflict risk. It's important that development partners need to work together to strengthen the resilience of all countries, especially those in Africa and CIS setting. And the experience says that fragility or conflict in a particular country setting uh, requires global and or regional solutions instead of um, localized ones as fr fragility or conflict can have a spillover effect. So more importantly, the solutions in Africa settings need to be agile and nimble as the conditions on the ground are so dire and rapidly evolving. Thank you. Thanks, Hyun. Great. Uh, Yotaro, uh, last, your 15 second message to the audience. Yes, next up, I, I think we understand we all share the perspectives and the principles. So the action is, uh, the next step is to operationalize it and operationalize the partnership, uh, collective impact, working together, humanitarian development piece to uh, address the drivers of the fragilities. Great, thank you. Cherie, over to you. You know, some 60 to 80 percent of the world's displaced people live in urban areas, not in camps. And Riataro's example of the host community and refugee communities in Uganda being jointly served and living side by side is exactly right. And so the, these facts point to the opportunity and the need for collaboration across our sectors across our institutions. And we think that there's a very, very simple entry point to really consider displaced populations in your measurement, in your data collection. This is a very clear entry point that I think Great, no thanks, Cherie. Sam, last word. Um, if I may have a slide, if I could, we could put it up, that would, I'd appreciate that because that's the last word I have. And if you look at this slide, you'll see just on the right columns of each table that, in fact, the number of projects getting rated successful in FCAS and SIDS, and we have the three categories, right? Countries classified as fragile, 
countries uh, in conflict and small island developing states that are not classified as fragile. We see that the number of projects being rated successful after they're completing has improved since the 2019 uh, evaluation then by IED. So I think, you know, as an institution, this is a serious thing we've taken on. Uh, we've seen, we can already see that there are some improvements. A lot of work still needs to be done. Uh, a lot better delivery, a lot, sorry, a lot better design, implementation and delivery can be done. But I think there's some good news uh, and in the horizon and we can see here that, that, that there's been some improvement. So that's, that's a good thing, right? To end on a happy note, Manny, thank you. No, you're absolutely right, Sam. And thank you for ending us with that. So you heard it here. Uh, first, operationalize, just do it, okay? But do it quickly and nimbly, okay? Do it together. And finally, measure what we do and report to everybody else. So with that, let me thank Cherie, Sam, Yotaro, and Hyun for what's been a very illuminating and really enjoyable conversation with all of you. Thank you for sharing your perspectives. So back to you, Saleha. No, what an absolutely stellar discussion. So many insights and so many learnings. And uh, Manny, you'll be very happy to know that this session was extremely well attended. Lots of audiences there as well, which is testimony to the fact that there's a lot of interest in the topic. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And for the audience, we have a little uh, survey at the end of this session. Please do not forget to fill that in so that we have your feedback as well. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye.